Welcome, everyone, to the Rosenbach's Virtual In Conversation With series. I am Edward G. Pettit from the Rosenbach Museum and Library in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And today we bring you Lucasta Miller to talk about her new book, Keats, A Brief Life in Nine Poems and One Epitaph. Welcome, Lucasta. Hello, it's lovely to be back. Thank you for having me. Good. It is, I see. You were with us for a couple episodes of uh, Sundays with Jane Eyre. That's right. Yes, yes. Which was quite um, fun to have you on for those two. So, um, well, before we begin, everyone, I would just like to thank all of you who are joining us live. And we bring this program to you for free. So if you'd like to help support the Rosenbach, either by donation or becoming a member, you can do so by visiting our website, rosenbach.org. Your support helps us care for our collections and helps us bring more programs like this one to you. And if you're watching live and would like to ask a question, please put it in the Q&A box on Zoom. Uh, it's a lot easier to keep track of a question if it's in that Q&A box for me. And the chat function on Zoom, talk amongst yourselves. Feel free to chat away while we're chatting too. I love to see an engaged audience in the chat, even if I know because you're chatting away, you're maybe not necessarily listening to us 100%. But if you have a question, put it in the Q&A. And if you're watching this as a recording right now on, on our YouTube channel, where, we'll, where, we, where we're posting this after, after the live show, I invite you to like this video and subscribe to our channel. All righty. Let us... Start then by saying Dr. Lucasta Miller is a critic and biographer as the author of The Bronte Myth. She has published and lectured widely on the Bronte sisters and their afterlives. More recently, her research has focused on their before lives, the romantic and post-romantic influences uh, that made them and the literary marketplace in which they made their names. In 2019, Lucasta's book, L.E.L., The Lost Life and Mysterious Death of the Female Byron, about the subject Letitia Landon, who was a popular poet in the 1820s and 1830s, was shortlisted in the U.S. for the National Book Critics Circle Award. Her latest book, Keats, A Brief Life in Nine Poems and One Epitaph, was picked as a standout title for 2021 by just about every newspaper in England, I think, right? Sunday Times, Times, Financial Times, Evening Standard, Daily Mail, The Guardian. Uh, welcome again to the virtual Rosenbach Lucasta. Thank you very much. And there are already uh, a couple of questions here. Oh. So that's great. Uh, but we're going to start with, um, let's open with with, with, with this. Um, the you, in, in the very beginning of the book, you, you write that this is a book for readers by a reader. And I was wondering if you remember your your first reading of Keats. Like, did you have a when first looking into Keats's oh. poems moment in your life? Well, what I really remember, it's probably not the first looking, but I have a very distinct memory of studying Keats at school. Um, and I had two English teachers who had very, very different characters. There was one who was this rather authoritarian father of four who used to take us out into the garden to read Ode to Autumn sitting on the grass and he'd you know teach us all about the transcendent beauty of sort of nature and truth. And then we had this other teacher who was much younger, I think probably rather insecure. He used to amuse us by telling these embarrassing stories of his own sort of romantic um, failures and sort of sexual humiliations. Um, and I remember him reading out Ode on a Grecian Urn in this really sort of cynical voice going, you know, may, you know, bringing out the sort of the bringing out those final lines as a sort of empty tautology. I mean, beauty is truth, truth, beauty. And those lines like, oh, happy bows, happy, happy, you know, <laughs> and really, and I was just shocked and wow. sort of totally shaken to the core because it's like all my class, because we'd all believe that, you know, this ode was going to sort of offer us a portal into, you know, some sort of transcendent meaning of art, meaning of life. And I think what those two very sort of, you know, polarised readings of Keats said to me was actually, you know, 
why did why why did Keats um, you know provoke these really different responses? And what I really fascinated in is the way that it's the creative tensions in Keats's work that give it its sort of creative energy. Um, mm. That in fact, you know, his tone is often incredibly shifting and ambiguous. He's a creature of paradox, um, and I and and yeah. So I think that I, I wanted. I don't think you can necessarily reconcile all the oppositions in, in Keats. And in fact, I don't think you really want to, because as I said, they are sort of, you know, what powers it and what gives it this, this energy. And so that those idea that that kind of always stayed with you and then was yeah, I think it stayed with me. And I also because I've always lived very close to where Keats lived <coughs> near. Hampstead Heath in London. Mm -hmm. And, um, <coughs> excuse me. And so he's also always been a part of my sort of personal geography. Um, you know, <coughs> I'm so sorry, I'm now getting consumption myself. <laughs> my, my identification with him is getting a bit too much. Um, <coughs> so even this morning, and I was thinking about coming on. I went out for a walk on Hampstead Heath and walked just across to where Keats House is, the um, which is now a museum that was then called Wentworth Place. And now is, that, is that the image you sent me, the Keats House image? That's right. Yes. Let me share that with people so they can know which. <laughs> yeah. So Before this is. And this is um, the house where he was living in 1819, which was his Annus Mirabilis, where he wrote nearly all his greatest work, including the, the Great Odes. Um, and the house at that time, I mean, from the front, that it looks like a, a single villa. In fact, the extension that's on the left of the picture was not there in Keats's day, so it was just that, you know, it almost looks like a child's drawing of a house, very pretty. Um, but actually it was really tiny because inside it was a bit of a, a bit deceptive because it was in fact two semi-detached two houses, houses, right? These are two, two different houses inside. And so, yeah. yeah, so Keats lived with his friend Charles Brown on what is looking at the picture, the left-hand side and their front door was round the side where that extension now is. Mm -hmm. And Fanny Braun and her family were living um, in the right-hand side of the house. Um, but, uh, and they were totally separate with two separate staircases. There's only one staircase there now because it was remodeled later in the 19th century. Um, but it's, uh, it's, you know, at the, at the time it was built, it was a sort of suburban new build. It's pretty in a sort of pretty Regency style, but it, though it wasn't grand. One of the things that slightly sort of, um, sort of, you know, made me slightly irritated in, about the film Bright Star was that the house in which they live is far too grand. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these were people from the, you know, the sort of emerging, rather insecure middle classes, sort of, you know, Keats from a, you know, an, I'd say a sort of aspirational lower middle class background. Mm -hmm. Um, he's not poor um, because he, 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 you know, he's inherited enough money to be able to um, spend a couple of years without having to make his living and write poetry. Mm -hmm. Please stop me if I'm just sort of rambling. Oh, no, what you're doing no because I'm <laughs> fascinated by all of it. I don't want to stop you at all. Um, but we can't. But let's let's take a pause a sec and then and talk about your book yeah. in that how. I mean, this is um, this isn't a traditional biography, and and could you talk yeah. about how you approach this and how you've structured this book for each? Of course, of course. Well, I mean, it's called a brief life in nine poems and one epitaph. Um, I mean, obviously, his life was really genuinely brief. He died at the age of only twenty five um, of, of of tuberculosis um, in Rome. Um, but you'll also be relieved to hear that my book is also mercifully quite short. Um, it's um, 
And the structure of it is that it takes nine of his best known poems and he prints the poem at the beginning of each chapter and then uses it as a sort of entry point into talking about um, his life and his times, his cultural influences. And I think one of the reasons why I did it was because I think most of us would have first come across Keats's poetry and Keats himself through anthologies where the poems are you know, a bit disembodied. And I wanted, in a sense, to make my own anthology in which I would sort of, you know, reconnect with their with their context, the context of the man and and of the world in which he lived. And that idea of um of of his poetry being disembodied, I think it's sort of it has an extra resonance for me because Keats himself, in terms of his popular image, has become a bit disembodied. In fact, it happened pretty soon after his death when mm -hmm. Shelley published his Elegy Adonais, in which he turns Keats into this sort of delicate, pale flower, a broken lily, um, a sort of, you know, spiritualized essence. Mm -hmm. um, and it rather doesn't quite sort of, there are lots of elements of Keats the man that that just doesn't reflect. Um, you know, I mean, you know, we may think of him as, and he was an incredibly sensitive and emotional person, but he wasn't sort of, he wasn't sort of weedy. When he was at school, he was famous for fisticuffs. And this sort of incredible drive and ambition and um, vitality about him mm -hmm. um, was one of the things that I wanted to recapture, as well as the fact that I said disembodied, the human body and physicality is a hugely important element in his poetic voice. And I don't think it's a coincidence um, that he spent several years um, training to be a doctor mm -hmm. um, in which he was, you know, really, I mean, he, you know, I think he's completely unique among poets, unless you can think of another one. I can't think of any other poet who had such hands-on knowledge of, yeah. Of the human body. I mean, you know, when Keats uses the metaphor a naked brain, we know he has actually seen a naked brain in the anatomy room. It has a visceral quality to it that it might not have if another poet used the same mm -hmm. phrase. There's a question here from Michael in our audience. He was wondering how you choose these specific poems oh. in the book. Well, that's a really interesting question. And when I first had the idea of wanting to put the poem up front, you know, I, I think some in some biographies, you, literary biographies, you get a lot of the biography and sometimes the, the works get slightly um, lost. So I wanted to put the poems up front and my first, but then I realised because he lived such a short life and because most of, his, most of his greatest work was written in the course of a single year, I couldn't just choose poems at sort of, you know, intervals in order to, you know, do it in that way. Um, so I chose the poems I think probably because they're my favourites, but also, I mean, obviously I couldn't choose you know, some of them that were really too long or I couldn't, mm -hmm. but I think it was because each of the poems spoke to something more thematic um, about Keats's life. So that, for example, when I, the first poem in the book is on first looking into Chapman's Homer, which was the first poem that, the first really good poem Keats wrote, the first, certainly not the first poem he wrote. Um, you can see him getting better and better and better. It's not just sort of, it's not just, a romantic idea of inspiration just sort of descending from heaven he's a, you know he works incredibly hard at um at poetic form um but it also allowed me to go back into the history of his education his social background because of course this poem is about the excitement he felt when he first read the translation of homer by the elizabethan poet george chapman mm -hmm. um and he was later attacked um, for only knowing Homer from Chapman's English translation because he had never learned ancient Greek. And it's true that Keats hadn't learned ancient Greek. Um, unlike Byron and Shelley, who had this very standard 
sort of elite public school education. So Byron is um, Harrow and Cambridge. Shelley is Eton and Oxford, though um, he gets expelled from the expelled, latter. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. um, but, um, and Keats doesn't have this sort of education. It leads to a lot of mockery among his early critics, a lot of snobbery, and also it's mm -hmm. used um, for political reasons. We can go on a bit later to talk about the, sure. The, about the political context. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, the truth is that although Keats didn't have that type of education and he didn't go to university, he left school at 14 to be apprenticed to an apothecary, he actually went to an unbelievably inspiring, unusual, interesting, progressive school where he possibly got a more um, fulfilling education than Byron and Shelley would ever have got at Eton and Harrow at the time. So although he didn't learn Greek, he did learn an awful lot of Latin. Um, he made his own translation of the entire um, Aeneas by Virgil, um, even after he'd left school, just for his own pleasure. He also read an awful lot of English poetry, which, you know, so English literature was not a university subject in those mm -hmm. days. Um, but with the son of his headmaster, um, who was about eight years older than him and became a great friend, Charles Cadden Clark, they used to read together Spencer and Shakespeare, um, Milton. Um, and it's you know, what Keats loves about Chapman is that he, he, and his style is quite Shakespearean, is that it is so gritty and it's so, uh, he feels it's really authentic. I mean, the, at the time, the gold standard for um, Homer translation was the one by Alexander Pope, which mm -hmm. is written in these very sort of smooth, polite, Augustan, um, heroic couplets, whereas, um, Chapman is, I mean, the, 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 the line they particularly liked in Chapman um, was, um, um, it's when Odysseus is coming up onto the beach half drowned um, and Pope had rendered this um, something like, um, from mouth and nose the briny torrents ran and lost in lassitude lay all the man. Now Keats and Charles Cadden Clark just couldn't stop laughing at that, I thought it was completely risible and it is a bit risible, I mean it's got this weirdly sort of detached itemised mouth and nose and then lost in lassitude lay all the man. I mean, it's this weird abstract circumlocution. Um, and Chapman, for that very same phrase, translates, translates it as, the sea had soaked his heart through. Hmm. Now that is so concentrated, it brings together the physical and the emotional. And Keats would later, um, you know, it, it sort of create in his very original new voice, the ability to, um, to compact imagery in a way that I think was inspired by Shakespeare and his contemporaries. But, you know, Keats does something really new with it. It's what Lee Hunt called his poetical concentrations. Mm -hmm. Why don't you read, I know we talk about reading another one later, but why don't you read that first looking in the Chapman's home? Oh, okay. That would be lovely. Let me guess it. <laughs> Sorry, I seem to be, as I said, developing a, a cold, even as we, even as we speak. Um, okay, so. Much have I traveled in the realms of gold and many goodly states and kingdoms seen. Round many Western islands have I been, which bards in fealty to Apollo hold oft, of one wide expanse had I been told that deep-browed Homer ruled as his demean. Yet never did I breathe its pure serene till I heard Chapman speak out loud and bold. Then felt I like some watcher of the skies when a new planet swims into his ken, or like stout Cortez when with eagle eyes he stared at the Pacific, and all his men looked at each other with a wild surmise, silent upon a peak in Darien. I always want to go then read Chapman's Homer whenever I read this poem, and 
Well, mm -hmm. actually, I think it is worth reading. Yeah. Um, when I was first doing my research on this, one of the things I did is I went to the British Library and I called up a first edition of Keats's um, first volume of poems published in 1817, which includes the Chapman sonnet, mm -hmm. um, which is this very small, compact little volume. With we have a, one at the Rosenberg, a, yeah. Have you got one? It's got a, it's mm. got a, um, a, a little portrait of, of, of Shakespeare on the on the um, frontispiece. I and then I also, I also called up a sort of a, a, a 17th, early seventeenth century copy of Chapman, which is this absolutely massive tome. <laughs> um, yeah. And it was really, it was, it was really interesting to to see them both together, and also to think about Keats reading an edition of Chapman that would have looked like that. Now, one of the wonderful things about Keats is that we know so much about um, the context in which he wrote his poem. So with this Chapman's Homer poem, we know literally when he was, when he wrote it, where he was, um, who its first reader was. So he and Charles Cadden Clark had 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 at this time Keats. He's um, you know he's it's 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 I think just around before his twenty first birthday. He's still working as a junior doctor. Mm -hmm. He wasn't really he wasn't just a student. He was basically manning the equivalent of the emergency room one week in four twenty four seven. You know he's he's involved in you know in in assisting surgeons. He you know he's you know he's really hands on medic at this stage but what he wants to do with his evening off is to go round to his friend Charles's house and um, they read this borrowed copy of Chapman's Homer together and they're so excited by it Keats walks home across the river because it's um, to Southwark where he's living at the time near Guy's Hospital um, and he's so buzzing with excitement he doesn't go to sleep he immediately writes that sonnet and then first thing in the morning he he sends it off by messenger to his friend Charles who is who who when by the time he wakes up on the breakfast table is this sonnet from Keats and I think he really knows that you know this is something special and this sonnet is passed on to Lee Hunt the editor of the examiner who Charles called Ken Clark knows very slightly and Lee Hunt thinks wow this is an amazing new voice and he showcases it and um you know and and, and that's how Keats's poetic career really begins and so he it decides to give up his his medical training and to um to turn to poetry full time mm -hmm. but this is not because he's bad at medicine and I don't I mean you know people used to think that you know he was this dreamy poet who was always staring out of the window and not really concentrating on his studies but in fact you know a lot more research has been done on this and we know that he you know it's it's not that he didn't he wasn't good at medicine he you know he, he you know he came sort of top in an exam that most people failed and he you know he he did he did well he as a wonderful story, you know, he saved a woman's life who'd been shot in the neck by her jealous husband and he successfully removed the pistol ball. Uh, I mean, you know, we've got, I mean, you don't think of, of, um, of, of, of a sort yeah. of, you know, the, 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 the cliched image of Keats as somebody who'd have a steady enough hand to remove a pistol ball from a woman in a gun crime. I mean, you know, um, anyway, so he, um, but the thing is, it's not that he doesn't love medicine, it's that he loves poetry more. Is he already sick? Did he already contract tuberculosis when he decided, I'm just going to do poetry? Or No, he's no? not. Okay. But his brother... That Tom, wasn't a factor. No, well, his mother has already died of tuberculosis when he was 14, and his brother, younger brother Tom later contracts it. Um, and Tom will go on to die in... Um, in 1818 um and you know Keats nurses him okay. as he in fact nursed his mother on her deathbed too so I mean in those days the um uh, you know the theories about how um consumption or tuberculosis as we call it were was transmitted were not I mean they didn't have the germ theory of disease and so I think that um some people believe that it was a sort of um almost like a genetic condition rather mm -hmm. than an infectious condition so I mean you know it is possible that he could have caught it Keats himself 
either from nursing his brother Tom, but it's even because it can be latent for years and years. He could have even caught it when he was 14, when he was nursing his mother on her deathbed in her mm -hmm. sick room. So he's not, so what well, he does start this publishing, and he meets Lee Hunt and, and, and starts to make yeah. these great connections uh, yeah. in the literary world, but he's not immediately popular or that well-read big seller at the start of his career. It's not until after his death that he becomes a well, I mean, this seems to happen, I mean, it happened with Shelley as well. Um, yes, yes. But I mean, in, in, in Keats's case, um, he does get noticed, and but he gets horrifyingly abused in the middle of a political culture war um, mm -hmm. by uh, what, I mean, you know, it's not quite the equivalent, but, you know, in political terms, Keats is on what we'd now call the left, and he is attacked by a load of right-wing critics in magazines like Blackwood's magazine, who are hitting out at him because, you know, he is associated with Lee Hunt, who's this well-known radical journalist mm -hmm. who's been in jail for libeling the Prince Regent. Um, mm -hmm. And um, Keats is, is attacked for being seditious, but he's also mocked um, for being uneducated, which, as I said, is, is, is untrue. Um, and uh, But, um, you know, they're looking for any means um, by which they can attack him. I mean, his work is called Driveling Idiocy. I mean, mm -hmm. we're talking about, you know, levels of, of, of mockery and sort of, you know, bullying basically sort of you know it's you know trolling in in a really really horrible way um I, I mean what is so interesting to me though is that in the wake of these two really horrific attacks that he's suffered one from Blackwood's magazine the other from the quarterly um Keats in this very sort of quiet un, unassuming way just in a letter to his brother just quietly says I think I shall be among the English poets after my death and and he was yeah. and it didn't hold him back because after after being on the receiving end of that criticism he went on to write his greatest masterpieces mm -hmm. um it's 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 a sort of uh, one thing i would like to say though is that although i obviously we don't agree with keats's early critics that his his work was driveling idiocy we don't think it was rubbish um but i do think there's a way in which we probably should listen to them a tiny bit because their recoiling from his work does tell you something about quite how original it was, quite how shocking it was to her, its first readers. I mean, Keats has so much come to be associated with our idea almost of the cliche of what it is to be poetic. I mean, you know, he's so anthologized, he's such an establishment poet, that I think it's it it it, it it's actually worth having a look at some of the more, you know, the, you know, when they say, well, we can't understand what he's saying, why does he keep coining new words? Um, or, you know, some people find it literally gross, like, you know, when in Endymion, he describes a, a woman's lips as slippery blisses. Again, there's that physicality, there's like sort of saliva there. They think this is just, ugh, it's too <laughs> physical. And, you know, they find it, they find it overly and really inappropriately erotic. Um, you know, as one as one um, critic said, and these are not just the. I'm not just talking about Blackwoods and the Quarterly. This is, I think, I think I think this was in something called the British Critic. If I'm, I'm it might be a, I've been another another periodical, but it said we can assure him, however, that not all the flimsy veil of words in which he would involve immoral images can atone for their impurity. So I think there's this the, the 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 erotic side of Keats actually is something that I think that some modern readers are still slightly in denial over. Is the is then that is the shift then where he becomes admired? Is that just a generational shift then that happens, and that uh, the next well, generation of readers do not find his works to be as you know well I mean I well I, I think yes I mean I think they they probably just well Keats's reputation is interesting firstly you get this poem by Shelley turning him into this sort of romantic yeah. martyr a sort of saint-like creature of as I said disembodied spirituality and this frail flower this 
Um, and um, so I think that really has an enormous impact. Yeah. Which probably has as much to do with Shelley wanting himself to be seen like that. Well, absolutely, because yeah. of course Shelley was also part of these culture wars. I mean, he was even more radical than yeah. Keats and Lee Hunt. I mean, he was a sort of extreme sort of upper class anarchist. Although I feel that you know he had a sense of entitlement because of his background that Keats never quite had. But mm -hmm. um, but I yeah. So yes, I mean the the Adonais, the elegy for Keats is an intervention in these culture wars in which Shelley is trying to set up the radical romantic poet as a, a sort of saint-like martyr figure. Um, then we get the first biography of Keats, The Life and Letters by Richard Monk Monkton Milnes in, in 1848, which is, you know, we're now into the Victorian era and, you know, you know, although there's an enormous amount of appreciation for um, for Keats's genius, there are elements of his life and imagination that are uh, that, that the Victorians don't quite want to mm -hmm. uh, want to look at. So um, you know there are you know things about you know the bawdy passages in Keats's letters are sort of uh, censored. Similarly, some of his comments on religion. Um, I mean, because he was he he was pretty much what we now well in terms of his own time he was pretty much an atheist which was mm -hmm. you know, quite unusual and radical um and um yeah and also the other um thing that doesn't go into the Monkton Mills life and letters is all the love letters that Keats wrote to Fanny Braun um mm -hmm. which weren't published until until later so um you know it it, it Although it's not, you know, it's not one of those total Victorian whitewashes. I mean, I think, you know, it's it's a it's a, it's a good book in lots of ways. It's just that, you know, there are. I think people still wanted to see him as this. Well, you know, it's. I mean, you know, it's that whole thing of you know, he whom the gods love dies young, and it's got there's a mm -hmm. sort of you know there's a, a there's a real sort of yeah romantic but on the other hand slightly dehumanizing mm -hmm. element to that myth that sort of and I and I actually sometimes think that thinking of Keats in that way almost makes us sort of makes his early death seem almost sort of weirdly consoling in a rather complacent way and makes us forget about what I would like to us to remember you know th again the human individuality of him and the physicality I mean the descriptions by his friend Joseph Seven of his sufferings in his yeah. final illness I mean you know it's not a Victorian deathbed scene of sort of you know just fading away it's you know it's sort of uncontrollable shakes it's uncontrollable diarrhea it's uncontrollable sweats it's mm -hmm. it's um, um lung hemorrhages it's you know it's it's really and it's it's sort of delirium it's you know horrific sort of nightmares it's you know it's 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 you know i i don't know i i feel that i wanted to just get close to the to the human keats the individual keats and in doing that i feel you know there's an element in which i feel keats wouldn't have minded that because there's a lovely passage in one of his letters in which he's writing to his brother who's emigrated to america his brother george um and talking about how he's sitting in fact you've got a picture behind you by joseph seven yeah he's sitting in his um in his study i can it, share that too went with place. i have a i have that image here i could share yeah that Severn did after keats had died he had made this yeah so in fact yes so this as is, yeah so it's not from the life but that is in the room that Keats um, had as his study on the sort of ground floor in um, in the in the in the place he shared with um, with Charles Brown, mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, so he says, um, and in fact, where Keats is sitting, you can't see it. You see, there's a bookcase behind him, mm -hmm. and just beyond the bookcase is a fireplace in the actual room. If you go there, so he says. Um, 
um, and he gives this very, um, you know, in the moment description um, of how, you know, the candles are, are burnt down and I'm using the wax taper. I'm sitting with my, sorry, uh, at the fire is at its last click. I'm sitting with my back to it, with one foot rather askew on the rug and the other with the heel a little elevated from the carpet. Could I see the same of any great man long since dead? It would be a great delight as to know in what position Shakespeare sat when he began to be or not to be. Hmm. And so, so I put Shakespeare on the wall of, up here too. Yes, that's right. That's right. Well, Shakespeare is Keats's absolute lodestar. Interesting. Thank you. Um, remind everybody, if you have a question, put them in the Q&A if you're watching live. Um, it's a comment here from Pauline, and I'll read that, but then Maybe then after that, maybe you read another um, uh, poem from the book. Uh, Lovely. We'll do La Belle Dame Sans Merci. Oh, I love um, that one. Yeah. But, and, but because Pauline had, had commented, just wanted to say that I'm loving your book. I haven't finished, but it is wonderful to understand more about the man as I read the works you have included. So it, oh, it, well, it is thank really great you to do very that. much indeed. Um, I really appreciate that. It was funny. I wrote this book during the really extreme lockdown in total sort of isolation, except that I was lucky enough to be able to um go out and do these walks um, on Hampstead Heath where Keats had walked. And so it's very strange when you write and you have no sense of how your reader is going to react. And it's just lovely when um, when I feel that it has spoken to readers. Um, I think I tried to write it in an almost slightly conversational voice mm -hmm. because because I felt I really wanted that connection in that in that sort of isolated time. Yeah. Yeah, I felt that in reading it too, and in and in, in, in the way you in, in your narrate your narration in it. Uh, Barb, Barbara had, had written in the chat here that uh, uh, it's one of the best books I've read this year, and she has the audio book. Um, so oh well, the audio book. I don't. I'd love to know what you think of it because I think the actress that they chose to read it reads the poetry really beautifully, and I was so pleased. Well, Barbara says the reader does an amazing job, and oh, good. And Barbara even bought a copy of Chapman's Homer because of, oh, there you go. You're fantastic. Spurring people on to read not just Keats, but also uh, Chapman again, which I which I think I better do. Do you want to read yeah. another one of these poems and we'll talk a little bit about it? And then we can of course. move into Fanny Braun too. That would be lovely. Thank you. Oh, before I read La Belle Dame Sans Merci, you talk, talked about Fanny Braun. I was going to read um, Bright Star because it's associated with Fanny Braun. Sure. And do you know what? It's a really hard poem to read out loud because it's all one sentence and there's nowhere to take a breath. So by the you get out of breath when you read this poem. It's like he has written in his, you know, breathlessness into it anyway so I'm not going to be breathless and I'm going to read La Belle Dame Sans Merci which was written before he became seriously ill La Belle Dame Sans Merci a ballad oh what can ail the night at arms alone and palely loitering the sedges with the lake, and no birds sing. Oh, what can ail thee, knight at arms, so haggard, and so woe begone? The squirrel's granary is full, and the harvest's done. I see a lily on thy brow, with anguish moist, and fever dew, and on thy cheeks a fading rose. Fast withereth too. I met a lady in the meads, full beautiful, a fairy's child. Her hair was long, her foot was light, and her eyes were wild. I made a garland for her head, and bracelets too, and fragrant zone. She looked at me as she did love, and made sweet moan. I set her on my pacing steed, and nothing else saw all day long. For sidelong she would bend and sing a fairy's song. She found me roots of relish sweet and honey wild, 
and mannered you and sure in language strange she said i love thee true she took me to her elfin grot and there she wept and sighed full sore and there i shut her wild wild eyes with kisses full and there she lulled me to sleep, and there I dreamed, oh, woe betide, the latest dream I ever dreamt on the cold hillside. I saw pale kings and princes too, pale warriors, death pale were they all. They cried, La belle dame sans merci thee hath in thrall. I saw their starved lips in the gloam, with horrid warning gaped wide. And I woke and found me here on the cold hill's side. And this is why I sojourn here alone and palely loitering, though the sedge is withered from the lake and no birds sing. Well read. Thank you. That's a thrilling poem. It is a thrilling poem. And even as I, I was reading it, I suddenly, every time you read this poem, I mean, in a sense, it, it looks so simple compared to Keats's odes, which look like all or, or, or the ones in Spenserian stanzas where it's all like looks like very sort of fat on the page and it's very, and the odes are very complex verse forms. This ballad form, it's so simple. Mm -hmm. And yet there is so much in this poem. I mean, I just suddenly thought that that line where he talks about for sidelong she would bend and sing a fairy song. Now, is he in retrospect? thinking, well, she just told me a fairy tale. She wasn't really going to love me. I mean, there could be a bitterness in that mm -hmm. as well as it, you know, as, I mean, I don't know, you could read it as he's sort of remembering it as this beautiful fairy song or he's feeling alienated from the fact that she's actually been deceiving him. What brought this poem about? How did he, when, when, when and how did he write this one? Well, what is so extraordinary about this poem is that it just pops up in the middle of a long letter to his brother George, literally out of the blue. Um, you know, there's not much context except that shortly before, I think the day before he wrote it, he's been for a walk on Hampstead Heath and he's bumped into um, um, somebody he knew, a medic that he knew, who happened to be going for a walk with none other than Samuel Taylor Coleridge. And, um, and, and he describes in his letters this sort of, you know, it's quite funny actually, because you know, Coleridge is sort of endless stream of um of conversation, the mm. or not monologue rather, not it's never a conversation, yeah. it's only a monologue, you know, where you know incredibly sort of deep insights seem to sort of you know jumble around with completely random stuff. But I do, um, but certainly that conversation must have inspired him in some ways, because one of the topics that Coleridge brought up was Nightingales. He later goes on to write the Ode to a Nightingale. And I do wonder whether or not the rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, which is written in this mm -hmm. same ballad form, and is also, um, you know, it's a poem about a mystery, an enigma that you can never quite solve. There's a circularity about... Um, you know, and also, you know, the, the the way that the rhyme of the ancient mariner is about sort of obsession and endless sort of, um, and, and this too is, um, so I, I do wonder whether or not, um, you know, it, even in a almost subconscious way, there was a little sort of element of influence. It's that whole in, that idea of that whole idea that Wordsworth and Coleridge have originally, that lyrical ballads to go back to these original forms. Yes, I mean, this is a very medieval form, obviously. And one thing that's interesting about Keats, not just Keats, but his contemporaries, the other poets in the same sort of group, like um, Lee Hunt. Um, and of course, Keats is so much better than any of them at writing poetry. I mean, we're not, we can't. But they all were attracted to these earlier po poets. Like, as I said, they preferred the Chapman to the Pope translation. They felt that going back to medieval forms, to um, Elizabethan forms was not only going back to what they felt was a sort of more authentic form mm -hmm. of, 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 of writing poetry, but there was also a slightly political edge to it. It was about old English liberties. It was about sort of freeing the English language from mm -hmm. its from its chains, from the sort of, you know, um, and, um, 
yeah so i think there are one thing it's i think it's really important to remember that for a young man like keats being attracted to the middle ages or to you know the elizabethans it is not because he's a dusty old fuddy duddy academic who's interested in history for that reason it's really cutting edge it's like mm. i'm really cool because i'm interested in this stuff there's a question here then uh, more expansive on that uh someone asks can you offer any thoughts on how keats became keats that is what literary influences fed into his original approach to poetic language Yes, I mean, I would say that very important is the influence of those earlier writers. I mean, particularly Shakespeare. And I also think Milton, the Milton of Lycidas in particular, and these poetical concentrations that um, Lee Hunt talks about, the way that Keats sort of compacts image upon image upon image, um, which, you know, Byron was really, who actually liked Alexander Pope, Byron was really snooty. He says, I mean, what does he mean a beaker full of the warm south? It doesn't make any sense. Um, um, and but you know, I mean, if you you know, and if you if you if you read, say, you know, like a few lines from Ode to a Nightingale, um, you know, that those concentrations. I think that's a very Shakespearean thing to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know. When you have like oh for a draft of vintage that have been cooled a long age in the deep delved earth tasting of flora and the country green dance and provencal song and sunburnt mirth i mean i won't even i can go on and on it then but you know so you've got this it's a glass of wine and okay it's cooled in the deep delved earth well that's that's all sort of makes sense in a literal sense then it's tasting of flora now flora um you know well okay you could say a glass of wine had a sort of floral bouquet or whatever they call it but no this is flora with a capital f it's a goddess so it's tasting it's tasting of a woman it's tasting of the green countryside then it's tasting of a dance so taste is getting associated with bodies moving in a dance then it's a provencal song so then it's a taste that is like a that is a sound it's not that it's like it it is it it's it's, it's metaphors it's and and then the last phrase sunburnt mirth that is so keatsian that sort of almost oxymoron because you know sunburnt sunburnt you know sort of painful skin something and then mirth laughter happiness and there's always something bittersweet and keats mm -hmm. is always sort of um I, I'd say it's just the way that his mind, um, you know, has this organic way of fusing things together, which I think, I, th I think is quite Shakespearean. On the other hand, there are other influences. And I do think that his um, years as a medical student um, did um, influence the way that um, his imagery is often so physical. And what's so wonderful about for example that passage i just read from ode to a nightingale is that all each individual image is very very sort of vivid and concrete on its own and at the same time they're all sort of melding into each other and it's the combination of that sort of you know that that clarity of the individual image with the fact that it's then sort of moving and fusing in this mm -hmm. protean way um, that's what I think is so um, ultimately Keatsian. Interestingly, I think you know that you know that possibly the most famous line Keats ever wrote, the sort of frig fridge magnet Keats line, "A thing of beauty is a joy forever," which is the opening line of Endymion. To me, that is the least Keatsian line he ever wrote. I mean, it's it's totally abstract. He's much more interested in concrete imagery. A thing of beauty is a joy forever. I mean, you know, it is. It, yeah, I mean, that's not Keats for me. Keats for me is something much more visceral. Right. Um, the uh, 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 Maybe then to connect that there, um, his letters, of which we have one at the Rosenbach, and uh, one of his letters to um, Fanny Braun, who he had um, become involved with, but was it then because he was ill and they didn't, and they and so they didn't he he didn't pursue getting married with her well i mean it's a difficult one it's an interesting one and i think that 
it's often thought, I mean, I mean, you know, the standard thing is that, you know, he falls in love, you know, it's rather sentimental, he falls in love with the girl next door, they can't marry because, um, you know, he's, he hasn't got enough money and he was not, he, or his health is, is failing. Now that is, that is true, but on the other hand, it's not the idea of a sort of, um, it's you know if you think of we're talking about you know Jane Austen era and this is not the, the love letters he writes to Shan Fanny Braun they are not the courtship letters that a Jane Austen hero yeah. would write to a Jane Austen heroine um, I mean these two you know they both Fanny and Keats come from a sort of middle class um, background I mean you know they don't have financial security they don't own property um, um, uh, but you know so we're talking about uh she is a girl from a but but genteel you know and you know no way would her widowed mother want her to marry um a young man who um has thrown up a uh a, a, you know a, a secure medical career um to become a poet he's you know he's been able to sort of you know he's gone through his inheritance and he's now you know his you know his financial situation is getting worse and worse um so yes no they i think but but the, the issue is you know let me, let me share a picture let me share a picture oh, yeah. while, while we're talking here first and then i'll share a picture of the image of the letter that we have here's fanny braun okay. So, but that's Fanny Braun, I think probably about 10 years after, Ke after Keats died. So this is her in later life with the sort of 1820s fashions. Um, mm. um, I, you know, I mean, the, the letters that he writes out, they're incredibly passionate. They're quite erotic in some places. Um, and, you know, she has a meaning for him, which is not to do with um, the sort of, you know the bourgeois ideal of of marriage that Jane Austen um, champions. It's mm -hmm. it's um I mean in this particular letter that you have in this your is the play, one that the Rosenbach has yeah. The... I mean I I you know I I I would so love to um to see that letter in the flesh. I imagine have you actually touched it? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. Sorry, but that's you know. Um, well, maybe you better not show it to me because once I have a sort of uh, awful confession to make that I once got a Charlotte Bronte manuscript up in the Pierpont Morgan Library and I wasn't expecting to be moved by it. And um, I, an enormous tear formed in the corner of my eye and luckily <laughs> I jerked my head away yeah. so I missed the manuscript. Anyway, um, this is a, I mean, this is a desperately, desperately sad letter this is written in um hang on it was this is um <clears throat> written in at the beginning of july 1820 now by at this point keats is no longer living next door to to fanny braun um in fact i did send you a couple of pictures including one of a sort of street with a with some houses in it wesleyan place wesleyan uh, place yeah. let me film that one here there you go is that showing no let me switch it. Here we go. There it is. Oh yeah. So in fact, so this is actually the street. It's it's literally opposite the road where I live in London. And I hadn't actually known when I first started researching Keats that he had lived in one of these one of these houses. I mean, there's no sort of blue plaque on there. There's nothing there to indicate that Keats mm -hmm. ever stayed there. Um, and actually, he but while he was staying there, he had another um, hemorrhage, lung hemorrhage. And so he'd moved out of there round the corner to another house where his friend Lee Hunt was living. And it was from there um, in Mortimer Terrace. Um, that um, should we go back to the letter that he wrote um, this letter um, Wednesday morning to Fanny Braun and in this in this letter I mean in fact he's only just had I mean I think it was on the 22nd of June he'd had this quite serious um, blood spitting incident he doesn't talk about his his health um, he, he uh, but this letter really I mean it is full of you know, his paranoia, his attempts mm -hmm. to sort of control her. He is, you know, it's it's basically La Belle Dame Sans Merci, this yeah. terror of being um, abandoned. 
being rejected, being, you know, and this femme fatale figure who, become, who is there in La Belle Dame Sans Merci, written o over a year before this letter to the real life Fanny is written. I think behind, lying behind that and also lying behind some of these sort of desperate and quite sort of cruel things he says to Fanny, um, you know, accusing her of flirting with other people. Yeah. And, um, um, behind that is the fact that Keats himself had quite a traumatic childhood and was abandoned by his own mother. Um, his father died when he was eight in an accident. And at that moment, instead of sort of looking after her children, um, the mother runs off with another man. And so Keats and his siblings never live with her again. Um, mm. He, um, they're brought up by their maternal grandparents. And the mother, um, you know, her marriage to this other much younger man doesn't work out. And then she ends up living in sin with another lover. And then she's become an alcoholic. And then she ends up going back to her own mother's house, suffering from tuberculosis. And Keats nurses her on his deathbed, on her deathbed, age 14. And, you know, once, you know, he won't even let anyone else sort of prepare her meals. He reads to her, you know, he feels that, you know, maybe he could sort of keep her alive. Um, and so these very complex sort of love-hate relationship, mm -hmm. the, the love-hate feelings that he expresses towards women in much of his poetry, and which you get in this letter as well. I mean, you know, and this, this it, when he says, um, you know that that you know tis certain i shall never recover if i'm if i am to be so long separate from you it's like he wants he mm -hmm. wants her to be so close that that she has no autonomous identity of her own he can't he, he you know he can't um he can't bear to um um you know have even think of her you know going to a party yeah. without him um i think you know lying behind this is that is the is actually the awful sense that she does have independent life and health and he is facing up to the fact that he's he's terminally ill um mm -hmm. it's also got this real split in the letter between the idea of i mean you know the sort of between the sort of virgin whore idea of, 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 of femininity. So he says, you know, you know, it's basically, you know, don't, um, you know, um, um, you know, it, if you still behave in dancing rooms and other societies as I have seen you, I do not want to live, mm -hmm. you know, implying that she's yeah. this sort of flirt, flirt. And then he says, I cannot live without you. And not only you, but chaste you, virtuous you. Mm -hmm. But actually, I think that this, you know, this is Keats in a really bad place. This is Keats experiencing the sort of full force of this sort of paranoia and suspicion. And, you know, he's, he's just, you know, he, you know, I mean, I feel desperate for him. What's really interesting is that there's another letter that he writes possibly on the very same day to his sister, who's also called Fanny, Fanny Keats. And the letter to the sister, um, he says, I've had no, he's actually, he's un underestimating how ill he is, but it's a very calm, controlled, kind letter. I have no return of the, of the spitting of blood. And for two or three days, I've been getting a little stronger in, um, in, in his letter to Fanny Braun, he says he accuses her of flirting with his friend Charles Brown and says that he's never going to speak to Charles Brown ever again. Um, and then in the letter to his sister, he says, I have this moment received a letter from Mr. Brown. Um, he is very well in health and spirits. So there's a complete, you know, so it's as if when he's when he's with Fanny in his own, Fanny Braun in his own mind, he goes into this incredibly intense, dark mm -hmm. and unreal zone. Let's finish. Okay. With just, and, and, you know, we're, 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 we're at, we're at an hour mark now pretty much, but let's finish with this, um, uh, his, his tombstone um, yeah. in, uh, uh, in, on which, his name isn't on it, correct? It's, no. uh, but but he does yes. have this epitaph that he wrote himself. Yes, here lies one whose name was written in water. Now, um, the tombstone itself was erected by his friend Joseph Seven, who'd been in Rome with him, um, and you know, with the input of other friends, um, and 
on the tombstone, in fact, I'll get the, I will read out the whole of the epitaph to you because it's not just that line. Um, um, it's, um, oh, sorry, where is it? Um, anyway, it, um, yes, this grave contains all that was mortal of a young English poet who on his deathbed in the bitterness of his heart at the malicious power of his enemies desired these words to be engraven on his tombstone. Here lies one whose name was written water. And it was because of this that I mean, this the myth arose that um, that that Keats. Ah, oh, thank there you. It is. Sorry, it took me a bit to find it. <laughs> That's wonderful. The myth arose that Keats was killed by his critics, that it was the bad reviews that he'd received um, in 1818 that had that had killed him. Uh, sorry, in a. Um, um, and um, but I mean that's not true. He was killed by tuberculosis. Um, but his friends felt very, very um, protective of him. And, and Shelley is the one who really sort of perpetuates this myth about the critics as murderers in Adonais. Now he did Keats, Keats did indeed come up with this as his own epitaph. Mm -hmm. um, but interestingly, the night that he dictated it to Seven, Seven describes how. Keats was actually calmer. He then fell asleep much more peacefully. I mean, he was probably seriously opiated at the time as well. But I think it's difficult to know whether this is a bitter comment. It could either be a bitter comment on the fact that he thinks he's going to disappear, mm -hmm. or there's something a bit more accepting on it that he's just going to sort of, you know, in an almost more Buddhist sort of way. Um, in terms of his disappearance, I like to, to sort of hold on to the fact that in the immediate wake of getting those terrible reviews, he so told his brother, I think I shall be among the English poets after my yeah. death. And the and of course the irony here that the, that that written water, but it's but it's carved in stone for, for us yes. all to continue to see. Absolutely. Yes, that's a very good point. Well, this has been absolutely wonderful. I could talk about, well, I could listen to you talk about oh, well, well, all really day long. This is absolutely it. fantastic. Um, really enjoyed thank it. You thank you so for much. Me. Thank you for, for doing this with us today. And uh, thank all of you in the audience for joining us for this program. If you are looking for more literary, historical, or cultural engagement, head on over to the Rosenbach website. Check out the other programs and courses we have. We have a new slate of winter offerings as well, both in person at the Rosenbach and online. And I invite you to please support the Rosenbach, which you can do by donation, or if you're not already a member, I invite you to join the Rosenbach. Thank you, LaCasse, for taking the time today. Well, thank you very much indeed. I really enjoyed it. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.